Uh, this is wonderful. I'm Barry and Moore, uh, director of the National Weather Center and dean of the college. And we're delighted to have uh, so many people on this lovely uh, late fall evening. Uh, I think this is a testimony not only to uh, the excitement that we've had this fall provided by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but perhaps the uh, constant and continuous attraction of the planet Mars uh, for all of us. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to uh, introduce our speaker, Richard Zurich. Uh, we share certain things in common. Uh, Richard did his uh, undergraduate work in mathematics at Michigan State University. Uh, finishing in 1969, and I was, in 1969, finishing at the University of Virginia with my doctorate in mathematics. Richard uh, then uh, went to the University of Washington, actually, as he just told me, to study mathematics. Uh, but the arrival in Washington and thinking about what he was going to do, he thought perhaps atmospheric sciences might be more exciting to him. And so in 1974, he graduated from the University of Washington in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences with his PhD. He spends one year as a postdoc in 1975 at the University of Colorado in the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics and uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And then with that very short resume, he uh, goes to JPL, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Caltech, and has become an outstanding contributor to Earth science and to the study of the planet Mars. Uh, he continues to have an interest in the Earth, uh, particularly uh, variability and change of the stratosphere on seasonal to interannual time scales. And that at Mars, of course, great fascination with the atmosphere of Mars and also dust storms on Mars. And anyone who has read the book or seen the movie Martian knows about dust storms on Mars. Now, that was the one area perhaps a little artistic license was taken in because the atmosphere is not very great. And so it's not clear that a dust storm uh, with a very thin atmosphere would you need some drama. And I think that certainly if you want some drama, the exciting investigations led by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of the planet Mars are amongst the most dramatic scientific achievements of certainly any century. So this is a great way to end our 2015 celebration of Galileo. We will start back up in February celebrating Galileo and uh, Galileo's world with a uh, guest from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory as we begin to explore other parts of the solar system. But for tonight, it's Mars and Richard. It's wonderful to have you here. Okay. Now you can hear? Ah, uh, better that that was done now than about half an hour from now. <laughs> all right, now we can get started again. So first of all, let's just uh, continue on here. And uh, to do that, we're going to come back. And what I want to do is talk a little bit about the historical view of Mars, even though I'm going to talk about Mars in the era of spacecraft exploration. But in many ways, the technology of understanding Mars, the technology used to understand and study the planet, started with Galileo. And that's because way back then, 
That telescope was the first piece of technology to get us into that. And then we're going to talk about what I would call three waves of exploration of the planet by spacecraft, starting in the 60s and continuing today. And here there are some names of some of the spacecraft that still operate at the planet, but we'll be getting into that in more detail here as we go. So in the beginning, at 1609 at least of this, Galileo turned the telescope on to Mars. It wasn't very exciting to him, actually. And, uh, Jupiter, with its moons, and Saturn with its rings, presented much better targets. And so it wasn't until later astronomers, but still using this new technology of the telescope, opened it up. Huygens was looking at it, and he could see a couple of things. First of all, he could see a dark spot that seemed to reappear, and he could calculate the rotation of the planet. And he realized that Mars had a day that was just minutes longer than our own. At the same time, you notice there's a little squiggly up there at the top. That was the polar cap. And so this was a planet that was looking very Mars-like, very Earth-like in its way. Some of the early maps of Mars, they started naming things with the Latin names for continents and seas and such, because that's what they did. Even the moon had these, of course. And not understanding what the albedo features might be, they assumed it was very much an Earth-like kind of planet. Telescopes got better. Drawings got better. And this is one that appeared in a book that was actually based on some of the observations that had been done in mid-century there. And you can see some of the features that today you might recognize if you looked at a map of Mars. In 1877, the Earth and the Mars were in one of the most favorable oppositions. They were close to one another, and astronomers around the world were observing it with new and better telescopes. And Schiaparelli, looking at the planet, thought he saw things that he called canali, which is Italian for channels. Well, some people misinterpreted that because they actually thought these things looked a lot more like canals and such. Whoops, I went the wrong way there, so let's go back. Percival Lowell in particular, when he looked at Mars, this is what he saw, a very geometric, very artificial looking network of things that to him spoke very eloquently of there's life on Mars. That actually wasn't a controversy at that time, at the turn of the uh, 19th century going into the 20th. Darwin's theory would suggest that if life could, it could evolve anywhere then why not on other planets? But for him, this was a sign that not only was there life on Mars, but there was intelligent life, intelligent enough that it could engineer a planet-wide network of canals, which was designed to do one thing, to transfer the water that was released in the polar caps to the rest of the planet, carry to the rest of what was otherwise a desert planet. Now, this was controversial even in uh, Lowell's day, because, well, first of all, other astronomers thought they had telescopes that were as good as what Lowell was using, and they didn't see these things. And in fact, when you're looking up through the atmosphere of the Earth and down through the atmosphere of Mars, it's really hard to see most of the features there at any one time. Carl Sagan has, is, was once said to have remarked that it was looking through a telescope that really got him interested in spacecraft going to Mars for a better look than what you could do with a wavering atmosphere in between you and such. So now we're ready to go to the next step of this. But before we do that, Mars had a, a particular place in Lowell's terminology of that. By the way, he sort of invented the term planetology, in which the study of the planet should not just be the astronomers and such, but it should be the geologist. It should be the biologist, it should be the meteorologist as well, and such. And he called that planetology. The two planets have similar land areas because only a quarter of the Earth's surface, after all, is land, the other three quarters being the oceans. There were seasonal changes. Both planets have about the same tilt to the rotation axis. So there's winter and there's summer. And those things change on the planet during their year. The Mars year was almost twice as long, of course, because Mars was further out in the solar system, taking longer to go around the sun. The atmosphere, well, it was thought that Mars had less air than the Earth, but it was enough. And the estimates at the time were about 
that of our own atmosphere. So if you measure the basic surface pressure on the Earth, it's at 1,000 millibars. For Mars, they thought maybe it was 100, maybe 85 or 90, but still thick enough to be something that looked like the Earth. There appeared to be active water cycles. For Lowell, that was water melting at the poles and flowing down the canals. For others, it was the possibility of rain and of lakes on the planet. So, Mars was a smaller planet, so it should have cooled off in Lowell's uh, view quicker, and it would dry out faster, but it was the future of the Earth. And that was, that was the concept that he had, Mars as a much older Earth. There were certain things that certainly indicated that there might be life on the planet. One of them was a seasonal wave of darkening in which they would see in the spring, when that water was released at the pole, there seemed to be a wave in which the features on the planet got darker, and that was thought to be, what else could change like that in seasons? It would be vegetation. We'll learn more about what that really is as we go. So here's the early views of Mars, and they were looking at it through refracting telescopes, and so the North Pole is actually at the bottom here, so let's put that in the usual orientation. And then what we can do is go, okay, here's what we saw when the first spacecraft flew by Mars. And it was then followed by two other spacecraft that also took a look at the planet. And you can see that at some distance, there's the polar caps. There are some interesting ring features there on the planet. And there's some meteorology. There's some clouds in these areas and such. However, when you looked at the highest resolution that these missions could get, you also saw that it was a very heavily cratered surface. In fact, Mars, instead of being the older Earth, looked like it was another moon, another cratered surface, and perhaps an almost airless body. They did an interesting experiment with this spacecraft, a radial occultation, in which the signal from the spacecraft passed through the atmosphere of Mars back to the Earth. And interpreting that, they came up with Mars had an atmosphere that was five millibars, not the hundred and not the thousand of the Earth. And that meant that it was almost all carbon dioxide as well. And that is a finding that has held up over time as we've gone to the planet. Something interesting about this is these were flyby missions. They went past the planet, they took their images, a bit like what New Horizons just did with Pluto flying by, taking a look, and only here, they only got a swath of the planet. And so it was interesting that that very heavily cratered surface, well, that turned out not to be the whole story. Fortunately, even though it was thought that Mars might be as, as dead a world as the moon was, there was already a spacecraft that was on its way. And in 1971, Mariner 9 became the first orbiter around another planet, other than Earth, of course. And there had been a raging dust storm that completely washed out, as you can see in this picture, all the surface features, except for there were these kind of spots that were there. And as the dust storm cleared, it became more obvious what those were. Massive volcanoes, including the solar system's largest, Olympus Mons, that had been built up over hundreds of thousands of years Mars doesn't seem to have the plate tectonics of the Earth. And so when you get a hot spot, that hot spot just stays there and it just keeps building the volcano above it. So instead of getting a string of islands like Hawaii, what you get is one massive volcano in doing that. There were other features on the planet, a polar cap that had some interesting spiral character to it and a, and a big canyon that go, went into it. There was a vast canyon which, if it were on the Earth, would stretch across the continental United States. So clearly, there were things on Mars, and it wasn't quite just a dead world. Not only that, but as the dust cleared out, the orbiter was able to take these pictures, which showed these valley networks, which looked for all the world like they were carved by water. And so, Mars, as an older Earth, came back, but it was ancient Mars that was the Earth-like environment as we went through. You can see these valley networks. You can see there's some streamlined islands there, that some of the channels. And there are some other things 
They look very much what you see out in the desert southwest because when you have sudden storms and there's tremendous rain off and then nothing for a long period of time, those kind of channels. So if we go back to what Lowell was thinking, yes, there were polar caps, but they were largely carbon dioxide polar caps. There was a core, a block of ice a mile thick at the North Pole. The atmosphere, 1%, not the 10% or so of the Earth. There was an active water cycle, but there was much less vapor in the atmosphere. In fact, if you were to condense all the vapor out of the atmosphere, it would form a thickness that was five microns or 10 microns on that. For the Earth, that would be measured in centimeters just for the vapor alone, not to mention the droplets in the liquid water path. So, but it was still, you could saturate the atmosphere because clouds formed and that was because the planet was colder than the Earth environment was as well. There were large diurnal variations, thin atmosphere, a surface that didn't have much in the way of water content, and so it was much like high deserts on the Earth, a very large day-night temperature difference. And the question still remained, how did Mars change over time? And it had ever been a place where life could have occurred. Well, the seasonal wave of darkening, which seemed like vegetation, the spacecraft showed, that's windblown dust that is moving a bright component, and as it's blown off of the darker surface, you see something that looks like a wave of darkening, and it starts at the polar regions, because just like on Earth, that's where the weather starts in the spring, and then again in the fall. So the question still remained, did life ever get a foothold there? In the 70s, that led to the Viking mission. So now we're in that second wave. Very sophisticated lander, orbiter combination. The lander was carried into orbit, they searched for a place to put it down onto the ground. Once it landed there, it had a scoop that would shove into the surface and grab some soil. Because the thought was, if I grab, if there is life anywhere on Mars, it should be everywhere. <clears throat> and I can pick up any sample of the soil and look for that. That's true for the Earth. If you go out to the driest deserts, you go to the coldest environments, grab that, there's still living biomass in that stuff. Well, they tried that. They tried that for Viking. This was the landscape that they saw at two places on the planet. You see it had a meteorology station. You see the scoop there that was used to get samples for the internal experiments that were looking for signs of life. And they found some peculiar reactions, but nothing that really supported life. In particular, there were no organics in the material. And that was a puzzle because Organic material is falling in to the planets all the time. It comes from space, from comets, from meteorites. There should have been something on the surface. And then they begin to realize what one of the consequences of a thin atmosphere without oxygen and therefore without ozone means. Extreme ultraviolet light at the surface. Sunburn, big time, in the sense of breaking up organic compounds and such. So there was one of the consequences of that. Well, that really gave us pause. We had been on this course. We thought we had a plan and a path to get us there. And then we began to think, well, maybe the problem is, is life either isn't there now, but had formed there and left some kind of evidence that we could be able to go out and find again. So let's start again. But this time, let's start looking for an environment that would preserve that. And in particular, let's look for environments that had water either recently or more um, in the distant past. So that became sort of the theme for what to do next. Before we do that, I want to do a simple meteorology experiment here. There were two sensors, pressure sensors, on the two Viking spacecraft. One was at 23 degrees latitude. That's like Hawaii here on the Earth. The other was at 48. That's like the U.S.-Canadian border in that vicinity. You can tell an awful lot if you have a long record of data. And this is one of the reasons we keep asking people to give us such long records of data. There's an offset between these two curves. That's the topography. There's over a kilometer difference in altitude between the two sites. That was there. And you notice that in some seasons, this uh, timeline down on the bottom, those are Mars days, and that's a Mars year, one Mars year on the planet. And you can see that there are times that the pressure is high, and then there are times that the pressure is low. 
In fact, there's sort of two minima and two maxima, and that says the atmosphere is freezing out over one pole, going back into the air, and then freezing out over the other pole. So those are the two minima when all the atmosphere, or a big fraction of it, about 25%, is locked up in the polar caps, and then other times of the year when it's all back in the atmosphere. Just imagine if you had that kind of situation on the Earth. If you lost 150 millibars out of our thousand, like in a hurricane, that's bad weather. And to have, it'd be like the water vapor was our only atmosphere on the Earth and was freezing out in the polar regions and back. You'll notice a couple of other things. You'll notice there's a lot of hash during some seasons. Well, that's the weather. Some seasons have more weather than others. This is a good spot to be able to say that, and I think you all recognize those kinds of things. There's also a couple of events here. You notice on the top curve that the blue line goes along, follows the orange line, and then it takes a big jump, and then it comes back down again. Guess what? That was a global dust storm that occurred. And what we would call the downwelling branch of the Hadley circulation, the crossing of air over the equator, moving out into low latitudes, it's expanded enormously into the higher latitudes. And that's because I'm heating the atmosphere with all this dust in it. And the more I heat it, the more that circulation expands. A signature of all that right there. The graph on the top there, uh, that bar is looking at the dated, the variation within a day. Mars has big, what we call, thermal tides, and that's just the difference between the day and the night uh, on the planet. Again, because there's not much to store heat, so it either absorbs sunlight during the day and radiates out. Hubble Space Telescope, this is two views of the planet, and one of them shows what happens during one of those dust storms. That's the same side of the planet. It's the same scene down on the ground, just hidden by this massive dust. Well, so it was an interesting planet, again and still, and we thought we had another way to do it. But this time, let's put some things down on the ground, some of which can move. Because if you're a lander and you land, and your scoop is that long, and the interesting thing is there, you don't get to sample it. So let's move and have that ability to move. And the pioneer in that was this little rover called Sojourner, which essentially had to stay inside of its landed platform, uh, Pathfinder, which was down under the ground. And the lifetime of Pathfinder was about two months. And so that was the end of the rover mission. They landed in what was one of those great big channels. And sure enough, there was evidence that water had flowed through there, both in the shape of the way some of the rocks had been changed and eroded, and also in terms of the composition of the surface. So the next step was, OK, if we're going to put more of those things down on the surface, where should we put them down? The Mars Global Surveyor was launched at the end of the last century, in the 1990s. And it showed us a lot of things. One of them was, was just the basic topography of the planet. It had a laser altimeter that for a short time, we actually had a better topography map of all of Mars than we had of all of the Earth, because the poles weren't well covered from the Earth. That's what you can do with a well-designed mission and satellite. The other things that you see here over on the, uh, what are your right, I'm sorry, your left, my right, and you see it, there are gullies and channels that were carved. Those look like they were formed by water. And there was this stratigraphy, layers and layers of stuff that was deposited, like in the Grand Canyon. So this was the kind of strata that we go. And yes, there was meteorology. You see the polar cap there, and you also see orographic clouds that were forming on the flanks of the big volcanoes during the day and such. So we were starting to get a good view of what that whole planet looked like. And here's the topography map. And you'll notice the reds are the higher areas, and the blues are the lower areas. If there was ever an ocean on Mars, the water would have flowed to the blue areas here, because those are the low-lying areas. And you'll notice that some of it is heavily cratered, and the north is not. And there's something that we call the green strip through there, which is where you sort of go from that southern highlands to those northern lowlands. That is turning out to be some of the most interesting places in terms of exposures of minerals that were formed in water 
and therefore telling us about that ancient climate and such. And so we had this basic map of the planet. So here's the new program that was started in the 20s. Because not everything went well, we actually lost two spacecraft in trying to do it faster, better, and cheaper. And as someone said, we proved that you can get two of the three, and which two is important. So these missions were going. You see the Mars Global Surveyor there on top. There's one that we just showed you data from. A spacecraft called Mars Odyssey. It was launched in 2001 and continues to operate today. And the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, launched in 2005, got to Mars in 2006, and is still uh, looking at the planet. On the surface, we had two new rovers that could move around. In fact, these were thought to be, they're solar powered, so they have solar cells on top. And from the Pathfinder experience in that Sojourner rover, it was accumulating dust at a pretty rapid rate. <laughs> and what that meant was, is that they thought, okay, the solar arrays, the power's going to drop and we're going to lose these missions after 90 days. So they've got to get everything done in 90 days. Well, one of them lasted seven years and the other one is still continuing 11 years later on the planet. And that's because the atmosphere does drop dust out, but the winds also take it away. And so there are many cleaning events on these solar arrays. Interesting. Okay, your engineering is now dependent upon the weather prolonging your power profile. And then the latest rover that go down to the surface is the Mars Science Laboratory, the Curiosity rover, uh, down on the surface, and it is working today, and we'll talk more about these things. When Spirit landed, this is what the scene looked like. And looking back, you can see the tracks of the rover as it extends back there, and you can see this crater that they saw they were hoping that this particular site was a lake bed. It looked like a lake, but unfortunately, it had been a lake perhaps, and there had been a deposit of material, and then a nearby volcano had put a lava flow on top. So I had good basalt rock, and that wasn't so interesting to my exploration for life there. The next uh, looks at this. There were a series of hills that sort of poked up through that lava flow, and there we found evidence of hydrothermal activity, hot springs. They had left behind the minerals that indicated that there were such events. And that's very interesting because those are the kinds of things where life might really like get a hold on. Something like the smokers down on the ocean floor where you have energy, you have the availability of water, and it all comes together in a way where chemistry can become biochemistry and such. Now, the other rover was put down in an area. This is a geologic map of Mars that was taken from that Mars Global Surveyor. And in particular, there was this little kidney-shaped area there in red. And that said, this stuff is hematite. That's a mineral that forms in water. This is a place where there should have been water for an extended period of time. So let's go down and let's take a look what's at there. So it landed. There's the platform. The rover is driven off it. You can see the tracks where it went off, and now it's looking back, and you can see the cameras looking over the front part of the rover there, looking at its landing platform and such. It did land in a crater, and you'll notice that there's this kind of dark stuff all over it. And it turns out that actually was the signature of the hematite. But if you were to look the other way, this is what you would see, this vast, flat plane if you want a nice, safe landing place on Mars, pick this spot. It's the flattest thing on the planet. There are almost no craters. There are the ones that are there are extremely shallow and such. And so the Europeans are going to test out their demonstration landing module on this terrain in about a year again and see what it does. What's that dark stuff? Blueberries, concretions of, OK, they're not really blueberries, but they look like it, don't they? And uh, it's a mineral concentration of things that forms when you get layered rock and you're leaching out some of the materials and it's being concentrated because there's water flow through that rock. So this was a place where there was indeed water. By the way, this was a good example of the value of a rover because it landed on that platform in the middle. It wouldn't have been able to reach over to this exposed terrain and to this kind of rock 
to really put the instruments down and verify that's what it was. Well, 11 years later, it's still working away. It's uh, gone into several craters, uh, looking at the layered stratigraphy of those. There's evidence that the water did percolate through the rock and that over time it became more acidic. There's more sulfates than there are clays, for instance, in the materials, in this superposition of materials down on the surface. And finally, uh, it's uh, still working away and it's been sort of guided every step of the way by what we see from orbit, where we go, oh, hey, that looks like the clay-rich area is over there. Go right, go right, not left. And guides the rover down on the surface. This is an up-close view where you're looking at things that are on the order of this size, and you see this kind of boxwork structure in there. That wa was water percolating up through the ground, leaving behind these mineral deposits that were forming that more resistant structure uh, to it. And then, of course, you know, every once in a while you see some strange things, like, what is that? You know, is, is, is that the tooth of a mastodon, maybe, sitting out there, that white thing on the... And, uh, but, you know, before you publish, you should take a look around, and sure enough, the rover just kicked up a rock, is what it did, and turned it over. So it was the less dusty side of that material and such. Okay, orbiters. We've had a number of them together with FISA. In fact, most recently, India has put an orbit, orbiter around Mars, making measurements and such. Some, what do we see from some of these? Down on the bottom there is a mosaic. And this is images that are taken at 100 meters per pixel. They're taken in infrared. And you're getting here a perspective view. Of course, the orbiter doesn't get to see this. But this is what you would see if you're flying in an airplane uh, over Vallis Marineris, this great canyon system. And this great rift in the crust of the planet is very interesting because it exposes layers after layers after layers of things that were deposited. Some of those are ash layers because this is near the big volcanoes. And as they were erupting and putting material out, some of that shows up in the color uh, image up on top and we get a view of where these uh, features are. We could also see with our instruments from orbit that there was ice in the top meter or so of much of the planet as you get to higher latitudes. So as you go further to the poles, the very blue areas there, what you're seeing is, is those are very ice rich. And we actually verified that by, we put a lander up there at the, one of those high latitudes and it dug down just a few centimeters through the soil, and there it is, that white that is just exposed, just barely exposed down there, that's solid ice. Ice at these temperatures is like steel, like concrete, because it's very cold, and it's very difficult. They shaved off some of that ice to try to analyze it and such, and they were successful at that, demonstrated it was indeed water, and fairly pure water at that. Now, you go, why all these orbiters? Well, what we're trying to do is to improve our resolution of what we get when we look at the surface of the planet. And as we do that, this is kind of what uh, the Mars Global Surveyor did, both in the visible wavelengths, where it had two cameras, one to look at the weather of the planet, where the resolution was more like a kilometer or so per pixel, and then another one, which was a meter per pixel or so, and that was looking at the surface of the planet, but in very narrow strips, hard to bring that data back. So we tried to improve on that. The Odyssey spacecraft that we just talked about that showed that water in the crust of the planet did that. And then uh, the Europeans with their Mars Express one. And the last one was this Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Now we're gonna show you some images in which if you take a single pixel of that camera as projected down under the surface of the planet, it's about this big. Okay, so I could see something like this desk, if there's at least an albedo contrast, uh, something to be seen there. And I can see those things. And to bring that data back, well, that spacecraft has been there operating about 10 years in orbit now, and it's returned 270 terabits of science data alone. Now, from our Earth orbiting uh, missions, oh, gee, that's a couple of months because we just get it all right here. We're close to it. But from a Mars distance, um, in which the radio time can be as long as, 
is 20 minutes or so. That's an amazing achievement. So what can we do with all of that? Well, here are some of the pictures that we've seen. False color in the upper uh, corner there, the diverse mineralogy and such, is showing you these different kinds of minerals that were formed in water from sulfates to clays and such. We've seen, we caught an avalanche at the edge of the ice cap, and that's what's over there. We have a radar that's able to probe into the ice cap, and guess what? Those kind of terraces and such that are at the edge of it that we can see visibly, they go all the way through the cap. So that cap was forming and eroding and forming again in response to what? Well, remember I said that the tilt of the rotation axis of Mars is about the same as the Earth? That's today. Over time, it could have tilted over another 20 degrees, or it could have been such that it had no tilt at all. In those processes, you change the amount of sunlight the polar caps receive. If you move that water, where does it go? It goes all over the planet. It actually goes to low latitudes during those times. And then, once the planet shifts again, back it goes to the polar regions, each time leaving a deposit of that. There's the surface layering elsewhere on the planet as well. Down there in the lower right, sorry again, lower left corner for you, uh, there's something else which has changed today. And what you're looking at are three images of the same place that were taken at different times of the Mars year. And you can see that what happens is, is you get something, a linear streak that sort of darkens and then it extends down what is a very steep slope, in this case of this crater uh, rim that is there. And then it fades away. The next year, it comes back and repeats the whole process again. This is our best example and what could be there, which is the action of liquid water on the planet today. Because otherwise, in the Mars conditions of today, at that low pressure and that cold temperature, if I pour pure water out onto the surface, it's either going to freeze or it's going to boil away into the atmosphere. Water will act like CO2 does on the Earth. It's a solid or it's a gas as a stable component. But here's a possibility that during the warmest seasons, you melt some ice, you form films, the films activate a surface process that makes these dark features and such. So it's an indication of where to go to look. We managed to get our composition instrument, which has a much bigger footprint, down on a couple of these, and sure enough, there are salts that are associated with the dark streaks when they're there. And if I put salt in the water, I lowered its freezing point by 70 degrees. So this is a way to keep water liquid for a much longer period of time on it. It may not be good for life, because now I have a geologic process that's competing for that water that biology would also want to compete for as well. So we talk about the water activity, and there what you want is you want not only water, but you want warm temperature as well, a stability of this, and not too much salt. On the Earth, there are extremophiles that live in very salty environments that are similar to this. The question is, could they originate in such a thing? So what we're really looking at here is we're not interested so much in this water as what's the source of that water, and is that perhaps the more habitable area underneath the surface of what we look at. Well, here's a way of looking at the polar caps again and showing you some of those layers that are in there. You see there are distinct uh, packets of layers and such, which do kind of map up against those zones. Here's a larger view of those seasonal flows on the recurring slope linear, as we call it. That's a term that is meant to be very descriptive and not suggest exactly what we think it is. But the best explanation is still the flow, probably a brine flow of some kind at very shallow depth. We'd like to explore that with some of our future missions. There's a diversity of environments. There are carbonates on the surface. That's important because if I have a CO2 atmosphere and I have liquid water on the surface, I should be forming carbonates. The mystery here is there's not very much of it. So you couldn't have taken bars and bars of atmosphere out. This isn't the answer to that early water flow on the planet. However, we have seen in the south polar cap of Mars enough CO2 ice that if it were sublimed back into the atmosphere, right now it's capped by a thin layer of water ice, which keeps the CO2 stable in there. 
But if that went away for a time and you released that CO2 in the atmosphere, you could double the present atmospheric pressure. Okay, it's not enough, but maybe it's enough that water is now transient for longer periods of time down on there. This is a false color version of some of those minerals that are on the surface. Deltas. I have a delta on Mars. Doesn't that look like the Mississippi Delta? It's standing out into the Gulf of Mexico. The stream bed there is an inverted stream bed, meaning that when you have a stream flow that's enough that it can carry the bigger material, that sort of armors the surface. And as the rest of the surface erodes away, you actually get that being the higher strand of material that's left on it. But that delta, the fact there are carbonates, there are clays, both formed in water, is evidence that Mars once had water flow. So this is kind of our view of Mars. And down there at the bottom is the scale, and that's in billions of years. So we think the planet's about four and a half billion years old. We think its global magnetic field, which was there because some of the surface is magnetized, there's remnant magnetism on the planet, but that seems to have gone away about four billion years ago. One theory is, is that let the atmosphere be stripped away by the solar wind much more efficiently, and so there was a massive loss of that early atmosphere. There was also a lot of volcanism that occurred. Volcanoes can put gases back into an atmosphere, water, CO2, sulfur dioxide, for instance, and perhaps that formed a temporary greenhouse effect on the planet. The aqueous environments, those channels that we see, if we try to date those, that is back in this period of the Hesperian, and there seems to have been a lot more activity early, and then it seemed to die out and be much more infrequent as we came into modern times and such. So that's our concept of Mars, but it's obviously too simplistic. I mean, this is planet, land area of the Earth. It's much more diverse than that. Some of the things we see when we look at the planet we actually see new impact craters. MRL's been looking for about 10 years. There's over 400 new craters on that surface. We got a before picture and we got an after picture. And in some cases, we've narrowed it down to that impact occurred in about a one month time span of before and after. Some of those craters, like in the upper corner there, are white bottomed. So what we do is we have a camera that has a fairly wide field of view. It looks for dark spots. And then, if we see one of those, a new one, we zero in with the high resolution camera and it says, yep, that's a crater, that's an impact, and wow, it's got ice, that's at the bottom of it and such. The blue uh, diamonds are where those craters occurred with the ice in it. And what we're doing is we're kind of extending the ice boundary a little closer to the, er, uh, to the equator by being able to uh, plumb deeper into the surface than our gamma ray spectrometers and neutron spectrometers were able to do. They saw water in that top meter, but they couldn't tell what was below that. And this is saying there's more ice down below that. Some pictures there of what some of the other uh, craters look like. There's weather on the planet and such. Let's see if this is going to work. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. Let me just go back to that for a minute. So what you would see in this picture is there are local dust storms that occur on the planet. What you're seeing here is you're seeing an orbiter that it's at a fixed local time. That is, it flies over every part of the planet at 3 p.m., 3 a.m., day and night as it goes around the planet. That orbit walks around as Mars rotates. Uh, well, it appears to walk around as Mars rotates underneath it, actually. And you put those 13 strips together. And so now you have a picture of the daily global map of weather on Mars. It's not a synoptic picture. It wasn't all taken at the same time. It's taken at the same time of day across. And you've pasted that together here. We have instruments that look at dust in the atmosphere and, and look. And what you see here is a time scale that is two Mars years from left to right. So what you're comparing is one year that if you look at the top panel, the really red areas are when you have a lot of dust in the atmosphere. And you can see that in one year, it didn't have very much. But in the following year, there was a massive dust storm, again, that covered much of the planet. And guess what? The temperatures, that's the next panel there, respond to that. When there's a little dust, they get warmer in that season. It's the dusty season. When there's a big dust storm, they get a lot warmer. And 
Also, if you look in the third panel down there, now we're looking at water ice. And, well, guess what? When the temperature goes up, the water ice disappears because it's sublimed away. And finally is the water vapor, a column that's down there at the bottom. And you can see there are two big, there's a big source that is the polar cap in the north. And then the water seems to be drawn out from that. But there is a suggestion that water appears before the cap begins to put water in. And that becomes, that may be coming from the seasonal ice or it could be coming from the ground itself. And we're still trying to understand that. There's another spacecraft that just got there about a year ago called MAVEN, and it's looking at the loss rate. And it's been doing its observations over the last years. And if they do a calculation of what's lost, and this is very high in the atmosphere, 150, 300 kilometers up, that this loss occurs. It, they've measured at least to one set of the mechanisms, the solar wind sweeping in, dragging molecules out, that it's losing about 100 grams per second. Now, somebody pointed out that's like a quarter pounder per second, okay? 100 grams in that two kilogram patty and such. That's not enough to account for all the loss that we expect that happened at Mars. But that may be because it's not the same sun today. Early in Mars history, the sun was dimmer, but it was brighter in the UV. That's because of its evolution as a star. And we see that by looking at comparable stars in their evolution stage elsewhere in the universe. So UV bright may have meant that there was a much more efficient process. And they're trying to figure that out by looking at the effects of solar storms on the Mars atmosphere and looking at these events. So this is still something in progress of, as it sweeps away. In the observations they make, there are just some interesting things. Aurora in the atmosphere of the planet, the bright features, and they're ultraviolet, so this is these incoming particles from the sun and such. Let's get down to the ground. Okay, here's our three uh, rovers that we've been talking about, three classes. You see the Sojourner one there, the small one, and uh, Opportunity and Spirit. And uh, Curiosity is about the size of uh, a Mini Cooper. It's a metric ton that had to be landed down on the surface. And the way they did that was something called the Sky Crane, which is, hey, you know, if I'm going to land, what I do is I take, put out a parachute, slows me down, fire thrusters, get close to the ground, and then I'm going to hover and I'm going to take a cable and I'm going to lower this one metric ton vehicle down onto the ground. And you go, why would you do that? And the answer is, is remember that platform for the small rover back there? If you have a big vehicle like Curiosity and it's on a platform, it's a huge problem to get it off of the platform down onto the ground. How do I do that? Ramps? Well, that's more mass, that's more weight then I want to use that for the vehicle and not for the landed assist there. So let's just land it on the wheels. And that's why that system was designed and built that way. If we have time at the end, we'll give you a little clue what that was like. So very capable, has a lot of analytic labs. Some of the key discoveries that they made and Gale Crater. The interesting thing about Gale Crater is it's a very deep hole. It's about six kilometers deep. It's 100 kilometers across. There's a mound in the middle of it that is higher than the crater rim. How do you do that? It looks like it was all filled up at one time and eroded away. How do you do that on a planet that's supposed to be dead? You have to have some kind of erosive process to do it, and it's not clear that Wing can do it. Although, we will admit, we really don't have experience with a landscape that has been shaped by wind for a billion years. On the Earth, most of the landforms are carved by water, even if that only occurred in one big rainstorm back in some ancient time and period. Water is such an effective erosive uh, process. Well, this is what that mound looks like there in the center. And as they go up, you notice there are some distinct lines here that look very sharp and such. Well, that's actually putting two parts of this image together, mosaic. But there are differences in the materials, and in fact, if you look there in the foreground, you can see there's something different there. And what we're looking at is going from dunes and sand-shaped uh, particles into clay materials, 
up to sulfates. And then there's a bunch of stuff that's on the top that doesn't have a characteristic signature of any particular mineral. It may just be mounds and mounds and mounds of dust at the top of this. They landed down on the floor of that, and they saw an image, the first thing, this looks like concrete, conglomerates, the material. And yes, this was a stream that was flowing on the surface of Mars when this was formed billions of years ago, early in its history. That stream, and you can calculate how fast, how deep that stream must have been going because you know the slope, you know the size of the materials that it was covering, and should have been hip deep on the surface of the planet. We don't know how long it flowed. We don't know if it was a sudden catastrophic event that did it, or if it was sustained over a very long period of time. But looking out here on the floor of that crater, found neutral clays and material. And the reason, the neutrality of that is it wasn't too acidic. It was generally regarded to be bad for life development. It was relatively low salinity, as it says. And there was energy there in the forms of chemical elements, phosphorus, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, that although they're in very small amounts, are the primary building blocks that you need. They're a necessary condition, so the area is, quote, habitable, but it doesn't mean that it was inhabited. Necessary, but not necessarily sufficient for it. We're just going to go through and we're going to look at some of the landscapes here. And you can see some of the rocks, and you note the pattern ground of some of those blocks and such. We think that's related to the groundwater seeping back up through these environments and forming these more resistant ridges like you see there in the middle of the scene and such. Other places, th there was also another aspect of this, which was, although the rocks are very old, they've been buried for a very long period of time. In fact, by looking at the isotopic elements of some of the rare um, elements there, it was estimated that this surface is less than 100 million years old. Oh, you go, well, that sounds like a pretty long time to me. But the key point is, is that if I had organics on the surface and they had been buried and only exposed for 100 million rather than 3 billion years, they should still be there. So this is the place to go look. As you look for things that are at the base of those scarps and such, the places that are most recently exposed. Well, they make tracks and they do go over dunes. Uh, in these images, these images are made with what's called the white balance image. And what that means is, if you were on the Earth, this is what the scene would look like. On Mars, the sky's got a lot of dust in it, and it tinges everything red. So you wouldn't see that blue of that. Uh, some of the older people here may remember when Viking first landed and they got their first image back, they had a nice blue sky until they checked the color chart that they sent for the calibration purposes. No, it should have been reddish. And that's true for this as well. But this gives you this sense and feel for what the surface looks like as if it were illuminated here on the Earth. On Mars, the sunsets are blue, not red, because of this dust in the atmosphere and the way it scatters light and absorbs light and such. So how many of you saw the Martian? Oh, good sampling here and such. Well, this is what Mark had to do uh, there, watching all those sunsets on the planet, right? Every day and night. And he probably would have avoided terrain like this because it's not great to drive over. We kind of go around it. But these are the kinds of exposures. And you notice the very fine layering that is in these rocks. Whatever made these deposits did it repeatedly and repeatedly, time after time, again and again. And that sounds like an ebb and flow of lake deposits and such on the planet that were filling this crater. So. Here's a Mount Sharp again, and you'll notice in the lower part of the image there are some dark areas, and those are the sand. Go sample one of those. And this is looking from above with the orbiter image and such. I don't know if you can quite make it out, but believe it or not, there's actually a yellow line that's the rover traverse. It's almost between those two dark knobs of the sand dunes up at the top. And it's getting ready to look up close at what sand is made of on Mars and such. So here's our program. These are the orbiters we've been talking about. 
Things to come, the Europeans are going to launch a trace gas orbiter that will look systematically for methane in the atmosphere. Methane is one of those interesting gases. It could be formed by biological processes, it could be formed by mineralogical process. But if it forms at all, and it is there, it's indicative of recent events, not ancient events, because its lifetime in the atmosphere is hundreds of years, not thousands or millions of years. Um, we're going to land a seismometer on the planet with the InSight mission that will be launched uh, next year as well in March. The Europeans are planning their own rover to go to the surface, and it will drill down two meters into the surface, trying to get beyond that sort of oxidation level that may have destroyed the organics and such. And then, okay, then what do we do next? Well, a good question. One of the things we'd like to do at Mars is to return samples. Our next proposed rover, built on the same MSL architecture and such, is to land in 2020, I'm sorry, 2021, on Mars and start taking samples of various rocks that we would put into, ultimately into a cache and bring back to the Earth. Why do you want to do that? If I take my experiment to Mars and I run my experiment, the likely thing that will happen is I'm going to go, oh, that's strange. I didn't expect that. But I can't do the new experiment without sending another spacecraft all the way out to Mars. If I bring the sample back, I can do those experiments on the same sample. I can go, ah, OK, maybe this is what that was. And for things where you're looking for wild signatures, signs of life, you really want the most sensitive experiments that you can get. And those are back here in our laboratories that are just too big and too massive for us to fly to the planet to do those experiments. So 2020 rover, uh, which is launched in 2020, lands in 2021, spends three years on the surface putting together uh, a couple of dozen samples and getting them ready. And then along comes a second mission, which has a fetch rover shown here hiding behind the rock so it won't get blasted by the debris from our takeoff of a Mars ascent vehicle which contains the cache. And it's taking that cache back into orbit. The cache would be something about this size with all those samples in it. Half a kilogram of material, preciously, carefully selected material and stuff. It goes into orbit. A third mission grabs it, brings it back to Earth. Lands it in Utah or maybe Australia. We'll see. There is one thought that I don't send that third mission as a robotic mission, but it's actually the first human mission to the Mars vicinity. The astronauts fly in, they orbit the planet, they look at the moons of Mars, they study it from a distance, they grab the sample, they bring it back with their spaceship and such. We're starting to talk again about humans working on the surface of Mars. The idea is, is that this if we were to start today, there's a thought that we could probably finish this by the end of the 2030s, get humans down onto the surface. There are a couple of things, and there's some changes in our thinking. Previously, we were thinking, OK, if we have four or five uh, human missions to the surface of the planet, let's go to different places, because we'll look at the diversity of the planet that way. In fact, that's kind of the scenario that's in the Martian, right? He's at one site, and he has to work his way over to the other place for the other rocket and the other is going to, to be. Well, now it's more like, let's do the McMurdo Sound kind of thing. Let's land in a very interesting area, but let's land with things that can go 100 kilometers away from a base site and look at things. And we'll just keep going to that place, and we'll build up the infrastructure there. We'll start making plants that use the local resources. We'll do plants that may change. And, produce a breathable atmosphere force in a greenhouse kind of effect or such. So knowing what resources Mars has to offer us is very important in that scheme of things. And we're just really getting started on that. A month ago, we had what was the first landing site workshop trying to figure out where there might be a combination of scientifically interesting places and resources that astronauts could use if they were on the surface first step in a very long process that will occur. It's not going to happen without an infusion of money to solve many difficult problems that we still have to solve before taking humans to Mars. But it can be done. Apollo started this way. It finished well. 
So this might be that next wave of spacecraft exploration. Apollo-like, someone on the surface of Mars, turning their rocks over, doing experiments on the surface, taking with them the tools that a geologist would take into the field, or taking samples back into a base that they brought with them, a laboratory there on the surface of Mars. When you start talking about this, instead of landing our one-ton rover, you're talking about landing 20 tons or 40 tons of material. And this interesting thing about the Mars atmosphere is we don't know how to land that kind of mass through that atmosphere. It's too thick to ignore. If you try to ignore it, you could burn up in that atmosphere, but it's too thin to finish the job. You can't build a parachute big enough to slow you down enough with such a heavy payload. So there's some interesting problems that are being there, and they're being worked, uh, including by uh, commercial companies like SpaceX and such. Okay, so let me wrap up just by saying, why is Mars still interesting? <laughs> there's still the possibility that there's life there. If you look, it's got many of the conditions that should have been right as we understand life on the Earth for it to be there. It hasn't evolved to stages of, of mammals or giant creatures. I, I, I'd love to see a dinosaur bone sticking out of one of those dune fields, but we haven't done it. It's just not there, or at least we haven't seen it yet. So that's the question. Did life ever arise on Mars? And if it died out, did it leave a signature? that we can go and know. Just knowing that life did develop for a time there would be a very profound understanding of our solar system and ourselves in that solar system. Okay, well, there's the other part of that story, which is this climate on Mars has changed dramatically. How did it do that? What was it like during those early periods and such? Mars doesn't recycle its surface the way the Earth does. No plate tectonics. So materials that were formed very early on Mars, billions of years ago, are still there at the surface, waiting for us to explore, or in the near surface. And then, of course, as we were just talking, finally, you're not going to go to Venus anytime soon. It's hot enough to melt lead at the surface. You're not going to go to the outer planets and their moons, far away, very cold. This is the right environment if we're going to go someplace else in the solar system other than the Earth and the Moon where we've been. So these are the things that we're looking for and such. So I'm going to end with that, and I'm going to answer some questions. And then for those of you who still have some stanima, we might show a little video of a simulation of the landing of the Curiosity rover with this sky crane reeling it down and such. It's a, it's a nice piece. But first, let's see if you've got questions. <laughs>